G'day bunny files. Okay, today's slight change of venue and uh, slight change of technique. I'm recording directly onto my laptop today and using QuickTime. Um, this should uh, speed up the upload process to YouTube. Now, um, last time we talked, we went on about um, compartmentalization, and today I just want to do a, a bit of a shorter um, upload and just to focus on one small item in regards to compartmentalization. Um, this is in relation to Ted Bundy and the book uh, Ted Bundy, A Visual Timeline. And um, so one of the things that I was really chasing up when I was researching Ted was I wanted to find uh, dreams that he had and like um, I couldn't find any. I just searched high and low and there's nothing. Uh, because dreams would have uh, given us some insight into the nature of the compartmentalization that was going on in his brain. Um, uh, typically, with talkback radio and the like, you kind of get people calling up saying, oh, I had a dream, and the person on talkback radio sort of starts analyzing it straight away. And that's kind of pop psychology. That's not really what we're talking about here. Um, typically, if you want to analyze people's dreams, you need 50 to 100 dreams, uh, at least thereabouts, and you need to do a thematic analysis and it's, it's much more complex so it's not so straightforward to understand the person's unconscious you can't just, just do it in one dream it's not going to happen um, that's kind of pop psychology we're not we're not really on about that but having said that i'm, I'm going to shoot myself in the foot because um let's say for example that someone found a dream that ted wrote let's say in all the letters he wrote someone finds that he wrote a dream that he had right okay let's assume that he's telling the truth and that he actually wrote what actually happened um you know, and it's the only dream we ever had. Well, I mean, of course I'd analyze it, but, you know, I'd shoot myself in the foot analyzing just one dream, wouldn't I? But um, it's like a man clutching at straws. It's all you got. So <laughs> you, do what, you do what you can with what you got. Um, but um, so, so this next example I'm going to raise now is kind of like that. I'm kind of shooting myself in the foot by raising this example. But um, I, I don't want to completely analyze it to death. Rather, what I want to do is use it as a, um, a kind of a signpost, see, see if it points in a certain direction that can open new doors into thinking about the nature of Ted's type of compartmentalization and the extremity of it, essentially. Um, so the reference is coming from this book here, which probably um, uh, you know everyone knows. Um, it's, a, it's a rare book. It's, it's quite expensive. I managed to pick one up. Um, now... Um, it's on page 88, and the, the, the quote that I'm going to read, what attracted me to it is that it, it kind of, uh, it kind of um, reminds me of, um, you know, it's got, it's got a dreamlike quality about it. That is, I'm assuming that Ted is kind of almost speaking from his unconscious here, and that kind of gives us a clue into the nature of his mind in a way that we norm normally wouldn't have. So... What this is, this is on 3rd of February, uh, 1975. This is just before he came to Seattle. This is on the day on the day that he did come to Seattle. He was living in uh, Salt Lake City at the time, and this is just before the Karen Campbell case. Now, Liz writes, As soon as his finals were over, Ted was to catch an evening flight to Seattle. But I got a phone call early that morning. Ted was crying and having a hard time talking. He wasn't happy with himself. I asked him if he had bombed out of his finals. That, that's his um, law uh, school uh, exams. It's not that, he said. I just can't seem to connect with people. Sure, I can hold doors open for women and smile and be charming, but when it comes to basic relationships, I just don't have it. There's something wrong with me. Okay, that, that's the quote. And um, it's quite revealing, I think. Uh, and it's to me, it has a kind of almost... A dream, not a dream, like I guess it's like a voice speaking from his unconscious. It's how I'm picking up on this. Now, um, how, why I'm picking on this is because the uh, the turnaround is here on the next page, page eighty nine. Uh, so that was the, the call came in the morning. Now this is the evening on the same day, um, and she writes, "When I picked him up at the airport that night, he was happy and confident. It was hard to believe he had been in the throes of indecision all day." So here we have a person um, in the morning pretty much uh, sounding like they're falling apart and then in the evening giving the impression that they're completely together and everything's all fine. And so you have these extremities of um, behavior again. Um, and this is kind of like almost symbolic of the compartmentalization um, function 
that Ted was uh, carrying in his brain. And um, so there's two things I want to pick up on here, and that was um, he, uh, he, he said, I just can't seem to connect with people. I think this is really fascinating. Connect is a really key word here. I think um, I'll, I'll, at the expense of shooting myself in the foot, like I just explained earlier, um, what it seems to me is that the word connect if I was going to hypothesize or speculate what um, was uh, going on in his unconscious, typically with an extreme compartmentalizer like Ted, you think that um, the contents of his unconscious would be have really extreme themes. There'd be some extreme things going on in his unconscious that um, would uh, reflect um, sort of like the way he's covering up and concealing in his normal um, social behavior and you find that in his unconscious you might get some really extreme things going on that uh, would uh, counteract that kind of uh, conscious outward turning um, uh, behavior that he's displaying to the to the people that he's he's basically con, con, uh, deceiving um, but in this case I'm going to propose a different hypothesis I'm going to actually suggest that if we ever had the chance of delving into his unconscious what we might find is that we might find him having disconnection type themes. Um, that is, he's somehow disconnected from the normal experience of humanity. Uh, he's disconnected from the ongoing stream of human experience. Um, and um, so when he says, for example, sure, I can hold open doors for women and smile. Now, doors, as you know, are typically, you know, uh, considered to be kind of um, thresholds between um, one state and another and it seems like um, he's conceiving himself here as a, like a door person a doorman who is neither in each in either world he's not in the world of um, people on the outside and he's not in the world of people on the inside and um, to me symbolically that is what I'm going to propose that you might find content in his unconscious that suggests that He's actually in that exact place. He's in this netherworld place, this no man's land between the two worlds, between the, the world of the living and the world of the dead. He's disconnected. And I think what I want to say, therefore, is what this kind of points and alludes to me is that um, we're talking about an individual who's probably extremely lonely, um, socially lonely. And this is different from being alone. I mean, the difference between being alone and lonely is quite significant. I mean, you can be alone. You can be sitting at home having a cup of coffee and by yourself and be quite happy and quite content and satisfied within yourself. But being lonely is different. Being lonely means not knowing where you fit into society, not knowing how you connect or link up to the greater world around you, not feeling that you have an important place, an important role to play in the greater scheme of things. Um, and I think this is the interpretation that seems to be coming through here. And then, as I said, on the other side, the next in that evening, he's he's looking completely happy and confident, a, a, a 180 degree turnaround on on that earlier behaviour. And this shows the extremity that is that he's capable of going through. So I think um, I'll, I'll leave it there. I want to leave it to the to the um, audience now to ponder on this. Um, if you can find the quote yourself, you can probably find it on the on the, on the web. This maybe you can, I think this book has actually been uploaded entirely uh, in its entirety on the web, so you can find this and go back, track it down yourself, and have a look at, have a read, see what you think. Um, and I think I'll leave it there. I, to me, it's fascinating. I think this is a very important clue into his the nature of the type of compartmentalization we're talking about in Ted. Um, that it's not a strict um, black and white scenario here. I think. We have to posit this third state, this no man's land state between the two um, states of uh, extremes of behavior. So as I said before in the previous installment, there's pro-social, um, healthy, outward turning behavior. And then on the other side, you've got this destructive, antisocial, um, inward turning behavior on the other side. Um, what I'm now proposing is that um, we may have to look at some kind of um, no man's land between those two states that Ted is kind of stuck in. Um, and that to me is very telling because it could give us a clue as to more about how he thinks and operates and perhaps even his motivations for doing what he did. So I'll leave it there 
Um, I thought this is what I just want to bring up today. I just, I was really just, uh, it came, I came across it as it struck me as being really significant. So I thought that's a good um, nutshell to uh, put out there today. Um, I'll leave it there until my next instalment. So um, uh, I'll talk to you later. Cheers.